Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, 24th of February in 2023, Susan Parsons from Arkansas is going to be telling us about the Metolius caddis in Oregon. And she may have another fly for us and some surprise guests to discuss the pattern. And uh, Susan, before we go into the weekly tip, give us a chance to do a heads up for everybody on that, because Susan's doing the weekly tip as well. Hi, everybody. We're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho. And tonight, we're welcoming Susan Parsons. Now, Susan lives in Lakeview, Arkansas, where she and her husband, Steve, regularly fish the Norfolk and White Rivers. Relatively new to the fly fishing world, she has been tying flies for about 12 years. While she has won the Salbug Roundup tying competition multiple times and enjoys creative time at the vice, Susan most enjoys tying practical patterns for catching fish and sharing with other anglers she meets on the water. Well, we're not meeting her on the water tonight, but across the digital airwaves, Susan, the vice is all yours. Okay, well, thanks everybody for being here. And hopefully um, somebody will recognize this fly and I'll tell the story about it um, as I go along. A fly was discovered um, by the late Steve Sobeniak from Lanesboro, Minnesota, who owned uh, Root River Fly Shop. And he also was probably known to some of you for the rods that he tied, which he, he I'm sorry, the rods that he built, he built bamboo rods. And the story that Steve told me about this fly was that he was uh, fishing the Metolius River in Oregon and it was his last day and he didn't have a very good day. Um, and as he was scrambling out of the water to get out of the stream, he saw this fly stuck on a bush. So he plucked it off the bush and brought it home and deconstructed it to figure out how it was tied and ended up tying it um, and fishing it very successfully in Minnesota, so much so that he mm -hmm. sold it in his shop there and he couldn't keep keep them in stock. He he sold them as quickly as he tied them. It's a very successful um fly, particularly during caddis hatches, but I expect it would work with other hatches as well. It's definitely a dry fly. It's it's designed to float. And um, I think it's deadly because this tail, I think, imitates a shuck. And I think fish take it very aggressively because of that. I think it's basically a cripple. I've been in situations where I've been fishing caddis hatches and catching fish on other patterns, including um, elk hair caddises and cracklebacks, and they'll take those, but they absolutely whack this one. So this is absolutely a go-to fly for me doing caddis hatches. So um, I don't usually tie it in this color. I usually tie it in this color, which is green. It's a caddis green with a gray body, but I was having trouble. It seemed like it didn't show up very well. So I tied this this one here in a cinnamon color and maybe it'll be easier. I don't know. It seems like neither one of them show up very well in my background. I tried a couple of different backgrounds, but we'll do the best we can. So I'm going to go ahead and get a hook and find my, my eyes here so I can see what I'm doing. And we'll go ahead and tie this. <coughs> I normally tie this on a size 12, but I'm tying it a little bigger tonight so that hopefully you can see what I'm doing. So I'm just going to start with a thread base as usual. And but the way you tie it makes it very buoyant. And that's what I really like about it. So once I've done that, I'm going to grab a piece of flashaboo. Not flashaboo, uh, crystal flash and tie that in to make a couple of strands that will extend beyond the, uh, underneath the tail or in the tail, which will be made from deer hair. So I'm just gonna tie those in and try to get them to sit on either side of the hook. And I wanna cut those so that they're a little bit shorter than the hook shank. And then I'm gonna go ahead and tie, come forward again and tie in another piece of flashaboo or crystal flash. And you could use flashaboo. Um, and that I'm gonna wrap the abdomen with when I form the abdomen. Now, Steve didn't always do this and I don't know that it's really necessary, but I do it because I think maybe it makes it more visible. Who knows? I 
the fish don't always fill out the surveys. So I don't really know what they think of it, but I put it in. And then I'm going to get some elk hair. And I'm going to get a bundle so that it's about the size that when I finish stacking it, cleaning it and stacking it, it's going to be about the size of the um, gape. And so this is a bit much and I'm just cleaning it off. And then I'm going to stack it here, but this is a bit much. So I'm going to take a little bit more of that out. Stack it here. And as I take it out of the stacker, I'm going to point it so that the tips are towards the eye of the hook. Remove those from the stacker. And so you can see that's about the about the gape of the hook. And then I'm going to measure this so that the post is about the height of the uh, hook shank. And I'm going to go ahead and tie that in at my thorax point, which is about a third of the way from the eye. And I'm using an 8-0 thread here. I just find it's easier to keep things tidy that way and not too bulky. Now I've, I've tightened down good right where I tied it in, but now I'm gonna work this thread back towards the bend of the hook and I'm not gonna tighten down very hard because I don't wanna squash those hair fibers. And I also want to keep that hair on the top of the hook shank. And once I get back to where my, my uh, crystal flash was tied in, now I'm gonna crank down on it without breaking my thread, thread hopefully. And then I'm going to work my way back to the front again, not wrapping very hard because you want to keep those those uh, fibers full of air so that it provides buoyancy to the fly. Now this is way too much tail, so we're going to cut off a third to maybe almost a half of that. We're going to leave a good portion of it on, but that's too much. So we're just going to take that off, throw it in the trash, a couple more of those off. Now I'm just going to come forward and make um, a post. So I'm gonna put a dam in front of there. A little bit more light on the subject here. There we go, that's better. And then I'm gonna figure eight around this. And I am cranking down on this pretty good. And I'm gonna put a couple struts in there or columns like Gretchen and Al showed us how to do on a previous Zoom. Just to give my post some strength. Now I'm gonna go ahead and go on back again to the back, but not squashing those fibers. And I'm ready to um, dub a body. And I guess given that the, the uh, I guess I'll go ahead and do it in the green like I usually do. because It seemed like that cinnamon wasn't as uh, visible as I thought it might be. So I'm just going to dub an abdomen. And this is, um, I use super fine dubbing. You can use any dry fly dubbing. I, this is how I package mine so that I, I package it in these little boxes that flies come, that uh, hooks come in and I drill a hole so that I can just easily pull my, my dubbing out of my boxes and the boxes stay in one place. So I can pull it out with one hand that way. It's pretty pretty handy. So super fine or any other dry fly dubbing, it doesn't really matter. And again, the color that I mostly use is, is green. Um, this is a caddis green with, an all, with a um, gray thorax. So the abdomen is green and the thorax is gray. Um, I'm sure you could play with other colors to match other insects. I think it's just the, the profile of this fly that's so effective and the fact that it's it floats so well because of the hair in the abdomen. We've got a lot of air. Go up to the eye and put a half, hit, half hitch because I'm going to use my rotary vise to wrap that abdomen. 
you can you don't have to use a rotary to do this. You certainly can do it by hand, but I just find that for me, it's easier. Those are in the way, so we're just going to pluck them out of there. It's easier to do it with a rotary because of the post. Otherwise, I have a hard time keeping the uh, crystal flash out of the post when I wrap it as I wrap my hand around the, the fly. So you can put on four or five wraps of your crystal flash. Kind of have to work around that post. So you got one hot hair in there. There you go. And then we'll just go ahead and tie that off. Cut off the excess. And then I'm gonna mount a, hang it out there. Then I'm going to mount a feather. And I noticed when I put up that other fly that you really couldn't see the hackle very well. So I'm going to tie in a grizzly hackle instead, because hopefully this is a little bit more visible when it's all done. And it doesn't really matter. I, I think, I mean, Marlene, you can certainly um, comment on this. You probably saw more of these flies than I did in the shop. And I think what I recall was they were tied with a brown hackle and green and, and gray. But it might be that the hackle was grizzly part of the time. I don't really remember the first ones I bought, but I don't know that it matters much. Um, I don't like to strip the stem when I tie in hackle because I find that um, in my hands, I'm more likely to break it. So I trim it. And I also like the fact that the little stumps from the um, Hair feather, hair, hair barbules. I'm sorry, the feather barbules will kind of help me keep the feather in place and keep it from pulling free. Because if you try to wrap the the portion of the feather that's not stripped, it will be a lot harder to get it to start nicely. And the other thing I find is if I pull back and up as I wrap my, my feather around the post or, or attach my feather to the post, I find a lot of times it, it behaves itself better as far as wrapping correctly when I wrap it. And then I'm just gonna come back down here and trim off, off the excess. Um, well, let me finish this step. I'm gonna get up to the eye. And then I'm going to get some gray dubbing and I'm going to dub a thorax from the eye back towards the post because I want my thread to end up at the post. So I'm just going to dub a nice abdomen. It's kind of a chubby one, but that's fine. And again, I want my, my thread to end up on the far side of the hook because I'm going to wrap the feather towards me. Now I'm a big believer in in super glue. I I use it a lot, and normally when I tie, I keep it at my desk on a little piece of plastic that's just a little piece of plastic that I cut from like containers you get food, and it's just thin plastic. But you can put the super glue on a drop of super glue on plastic and put it on your desk and it won't set up for over an hour. And then I use a hypodermic needle. This is a size 22. It's fairly small to put it on. I find that I can be really precise with it. It will over time get kind of gunked up, but you just take a, a um, razor blade and scrape off your, your needle and it's good as new. And I normally would put a little a little glue right here on the post just a little bit before I wrap the feather but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get the glue on my on my camera lens so I'll skip that this time so then we're just going to wrap the the post as you would in the other fly that has a post and I usually put oh four or five um, wraps and then since my high, my thread is behind the fly I can come around opposite of the direction of that I wrapped the hackle and catch my hackle And I'll go about three times around, make sure it's nice and snug. And then I can go ahead and cut off 
the excess of the feather and the fibers that I caught that are pointing downwards. And then I'm just gonna come underneath the abdomen with my thread and up to the eye and whip finish it. You know, that hackle does show up better than the other hackle I, I was using earlier today. So really you, you can put any, any combination of colors you like. So that's the tie. Now the last thing we need to do, I will look over here and I did, it looks like I did catch a deer here. So I'll just trim him out of there. The last thing we need to do is trim the tail and you don't want the tail to be pretty. You don't want it to be nice and orderly. You just kind of get in here and chop away at it and make it irregular. Because if this is imitating the shuck, a shuck is not a, a nice symmetric thing necessarily as it opens up. So that's the tie. The one thing I don't like about this fly is that because this tail is made of deer hair, the deer hair is what, what wears out. And so you'll catch several fish on it, but after a while that tail is just chewed away. But meanwhile, you caught several fish on it. <laughs> so it's it's just a very, very um, attractive fly to fish. I really do um, enjoy it. And and it's uh, you'll you'll see the difference if you're if you're fishing this fly and another fly that imitates a caddis or other insects of similar size, you will see a difference in the way fish react to this fly. Did you want to have Lance chime in at this time? That'd be great. So yeah. any more insight is in, into it, where it came from other than he found it? And it uh, became his signature uh, fly. And 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 by the way, he did give me permission a couple of years ago to share it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I remember Tim talking about it. He, yeah. Uh, he, so like the story goes, him and his dad were fishing on the Metolius River and nothing was working. And they found that fly in a tree and Steve just tied it on and all of a sudden they started catching a bunch of fish and they couldn't find it anywhere in any fly shop or anything so they replicated it and sort of tweaked it on their own but um yeah it's kind of become his signature fly that so we have no i no idea who the original hire of that fly was no no it's probably someone without you know, any social media because those are the best people on the water. <laughs> well, maybe somebody who, if they find out about it, that it's yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? They're going to yeah. be really disappointed. <laughs> yeah, they should come claim it. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a handwritten note from Steve that said in the 80s, my dad and I fished the Metolius in Oregon and I found a fly similar to this and I've been tying it ever since and named it the Metolius caddis, a great attractor fly. I found this in a box that I had. Can't oh. believe it. <laughs> yeah. wow. Can I just say um, something? Um, you know, Lance and Elena, which who is Steve's um, daughter, now own River Rodco in Lanesboro, Minnesota. And so um, I just wanted to kind of mention that because um, he's doing a great job. Um, we miss Steve dearly mm -hmm. and um, quite a legacy they have to fill, but I, they're doing great. So um I think if you have questions too, you can call the shop there in Lanesboro too. So, and and I fish this fly often, and it does work underwater too. I've had fish oh. bite over it. So, how far underwater? I don't know. I was just like tired of catching fish one day, and I pulled my, I was reeling up my line, and um, two fish were after it. So, mm -hmm. just underneath the water. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it works around the country too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you, uh, okay. you kind of like skate them too because they float so good they yeah they yeah. Yeah, yeah i love a f when i when i, I want to fly to float i want it to float yeah and this yeah. one floats oh, Let yeah. lance what, up a lot lance what size do you usually uh fish it in uh i usually tie a 14 14, so 14. 14. yeah yeah and so you know you can go bigger or smaller from there but <clears throat> Uh, like this one here is a 14 on this and then that's because it's they're so bulky that they become pretty much bigger mm -hmm. uh, but yeah and then so in the in the little chat i posted a link to like a 
YouTube of what Steve tied it. So if you want to watch, you can look off his. And then I think Susan recorded too. So you're probably, I don't know if you're going to share this, Susan. Hey, um, any, you might ready to move on to the next fly there, Susan? Yeah, I think we can. Let me get back any, to my other camera. Anything, Lance, thanks so much for being here. Anything yeah, more on this one, Lance, yeah. before you leave? Uh, no, definitely worth giving it a try with. So some of you have been around a lot longer than I have are probably wondering why in the world is this woman tying a crackle back on this Zoom? Because this is such a basic fly. But it's a really great fly. And um, this fly was created by Ed Story, who owned um, Feathercraft in St. Louis. And he wanted a fly that would be very versatile. And in fact, this fly is, you can, you can fish it as a dry fly. You can fish it, drift it in the film. You can strip it. You can um, swing it and you can fish it um, behind a heavier nymph uh, so that it rises above the nymph. Or you can also put a bead on it and, and uh, fish it as a nymph. Um, there are many versions of it. He originally tied, tied it with a, a body of turkey biot and the crackle on the back, which you may be able to see is, um, it's just, a, it's, a, it's strips, it, it's pieces of peacock curl and it makes, it's kind of hard to see on the camera, but it, cause this is kind of small, but it's, it's just a dark, attractive, flashy line on the back. Some people use other uh, materials um, such as cream egg, or other uh, iridescent type materials, but I always just use the original material, which was a peacock curl. And then a lot of people dub them instead of using the, the turkey biots, but I find that the dubbing absorbs water. And I think that using Unistretch, it absorbs less water. And I also find that it's easier to tie that way. I, I tend to tie a lot of these because we use a lot of them. If my husband, Steve is waiting, he's almost, certainly fishing one of these unless he's fishing a metolius. And so I tie a lot of them and I wanna tie them as quickly and easily as I can. So that's the reason I'm tying this tonight is to show you how, uh, just another way to tie this fly in a method that's uh, pretty quick and easy. So I'm gonna put a hook on here, a different hook, and I'll show you the other thing that I do when I tie this fly that's different than the usual way. I think maybe you can actually see better without that extra light. So I'm just going to go ahead and start my unistretch right on the right on the hook, no thread base. And I'm going to go back to the bend and come forward a little bit, get that little flatter. And I didn't used to put a wire on these. Ed did not put a wire. But what I found is you get to some of these smaller streams where um, fish are really aggressive and toothy and probably in bigger streams where they're aggressive and toothy as well. Um, the fly just doesn't last very long. The, the hackle gets ripped off. So I started putting a wire on. And I always use an extra small wire. I'm going to use a small wire here and hopefully... Yeah, that's pretty visible. And hopefully you'll be able to see this. So now I'm just going to put a little kink in my wire. So I don't know if you can see that kink so that when I catch the wire, it'll stay put. So I'm going to catch my wire, put it on, and then I'm going to come forward and I'm going to get some Peacock curl, I'm gonna get three strands for this bigger fly. I would put two strands on a size 12 or 14, which is what I usually tie, but this is a size eight, so you can see it better. And I'm just gonna take these three strands and tie them in, get rid of the butts of them. And this is what's going to get doubled back over to form our back on our crackleback. Now I'm still just using my unit stretch to tie everything in, and I'm going to go ahead and tie in a hackle. And this is a, a furnace 
saddle hackle. It's pretty long though. Wait a minute, that's the wrong one. Let's see here. That one's better. This one might be a little short, but it'll, it'll work. So again, I'm gonna trim this hackle. And I'm gonna tie it in on the top, but as I go towards the back, I'm gonna bring it to the near side. And I am tying it in so that again, I have a little bit of the, of the trim stem to start my wraps with. So now I've got my three components tied in and I'm gonna use my unistretch to form a nicely shaped body. Oops. Now I'm going to go ahead and tie in my thread, which in this case is an olive 8.0. I'm just going to go ahead and start my thread as I normally would. I'm going to cut off this tag end. And I'm going to go ahead and catch my uni stretch with my thread and cut off the excess. I'm going to make sure it's really tied down good. I'm going to wrap to the eye and come back a little bit. And then I'm going to take my three strands of peacock curl and I just kind of sort of braid them together, wrap them around each other so that they just a couple times so that they stay together on the back because you want you don't really want them to separate. You want them to be a strip down the back of the fly. I'm going to tie them in. three or four wraps and trim them off. I'm gonna put a half hitch in. And then again, I'm gonna use my rotary to put my hackle on. Now, the one thing that I do differently is I, I don't like the fact that when you counter wrap a wire, you end up squashing down so many of the fibers of the hackle. So I do something unconventional. I come under the fly with the hackle once, and then I follow with the wire, and this is a larger wire than I usually use, but hopefully you can see it. And then I'll go around the back of the hackle with the wire, and then come back in front. And that usually does it. So now I am going to wrap the wire and the hackle together. And it usually works. Sometimes I have to adjust it a little bit. But the goal is to get that wire and the hackle to wrap together so that it's almost like your wire is creating a second stem on the hackle and strengthening it. But while it's doing that, it's not squashing the hackle fibers down as it, as it would if you were to um, counter wrap it. So you can see how pretty that came out. And I think you can see the wire in there. And now I'm gonna go ahead and catch both wire and hackle and go about three times around. And then I'm gonna take the, ha the wire to the back and just go in front of it and go ahead and helicopter off my wire. Now I would normally put um, super glue on the head, but I didn't want to because of my, I didn't want to get super glue on the camera. And that's also something I meant to mention on the other fly, I normally put uh, super glue where the, I cut the feather off and also on the, on the um, head. But hopefully you can see, let me see if I can get that, a, whoopsie, a little closer. Maybe you can I'll try to focus in on that. You can see, I hope that wire is going right on top of the hackle and protecting the hackle. And I do find that you can pretty much see it there. 
I think. I do, I do find that it's more durable than when I don't put the wire on. But usually Gretchen and I do the weekly tip, but uh, sometimes other people come up with great, great ideas. Tonight, Susan Parsons is going to give us the tip. And here you go, Susan. Okay, so this tip arises from my recent adventures at tying for the competition, the Salbug Fly Tying Competition. This is a October Caddis um, emerger, nymph emerger, um, or pupa, I should say, emerger. So anyway, I, I always get creative for the Salbug Roundup, and you have to if you're going to have any chance of winning. And so I wanted to do something different for legs, and I don't know how well you can see these, but these legs are have a really nice profile because they stick out like a caddis's legs do. And I you can also do this like for dragonfly legs or um, cicada legs. And obviously, you're not going to do this every day necessarily. But if you want to just have something look more realistic or just have fun with it, and I will admit, uh, usually there's a glass of wine next to me when I'm when I'm getting creative for the salad competition. But you can see how cool these legs look. They they just really stick out like insect legs do. And so here is how I created them. They are created from a hackle. This is a rooster hackle that I strip off. I started stripping this one earlier and I thought, no, I'll strip it on, on the Zoom. So you're just gonna strip off those fibers and you strip down to where it's pretty small. And hopefully you can see that it has, boy, it's so hard on this. I need a better camera, I guess. But maybe you can kind of see that, you can see the where the fibers were, it leaves almost a segmented look, little dots on the side of the leg, what will become my leg. So once I've stripped this off, I take a piece of this stretch tubing, that looks like this. And this is really a tubing. It's, it really is a tube. It's not just the plastic material, it's a tube. And this one is a, is a small, and it's the biggest one I have. You take your stripped feather and you cut the smaller tip off. And then you get a little piece of tubing that you have cut to the length that you want the first part of the leg to be, and you insert that through, you insert your stem, your, your feather stem, through your piece of tubing. And then you can cut off your excess and get it to where you want, where they look approximately equal. And then you just bend the feather, the stem. And that creates that effect. And then you come on the other side and you do the same thing. So now you have these really cool leg assemblies. And I have tied one on already on this, this hook that I'll put in the vise. Find some thread. And I'm going to just go ahead and get this started. And so you would just put these on your fly at whatever point you wanted to add legs to a fly. Get this a little bit straighter in the vise. And then you can take your leg assembly. And because it's so long, you can, you can control it easily with your fingers. So you can push it back a little bit if you need to. And if you figure eight around it, you can really position them quite nicely. And if you don't get it quite centered, you can actually pull them across a little bit to the other side or towards you, whichever you need to do. And you can roll them up or down and put them in whatever position you want them in because you really have a lot of control over them. And the rubber is very forgiving. You're not gonna break them tying them in. And you can even push them back as you tie them in. See that, how that went back? So there's two sets in. Now I'll grab my third one, unless I've lost it on my table here. Ah, there it is. 
while you're finding it, John Kreft thinks it's a great tip. And I just had to pick Gretchen up off the floor. She just thought it was wonderful. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's just one of those things I came up with. How, how can I make cool legs on this fly as I was tying for the competition? I mean, you can do anything you want, right? That's very true. So there you go. That, that is absolutely awesome. Great tip. Have some more wine, yeah. Susan. And then you just trim them to whatever length you want. And I suppose if you wanted, you could maybe even, I haven't tried this, maybe you could get your bodkin and bend it again before you trimmed it. Or maybe a tool of some kind. Let's see what we can find to bend the puppy before we cut it off. That's, yeah, I just got creative. That's what it takes. And very easy to control. You know how frustrating it can be to put legs on, but these are, because you put on a pair at a time. And tonight I used um, just a strong rooster saddle hackle. And I think that was better than what I used when I tied for the competition because I used a dry fly hackle and it was a little too brittle and they're more likely to break and I had to super glue them. But there you go. Cool, <laughs> cool insect legs. That question goes back at about four or six mm -hmm. weeks ago on one of the programs that you guys put on somebody brought up a little product i believe it was called thread magic oh, yeah that was... and, and i think it's it was made originally to treat the thread to make it more yeah so were you guys talking about using that on cracked fingers or just to treat the thread i use it i use it on cracked fingers Okay. Person, how do you use it? Well, when you're in Atlantic salmon fly tying, when you're working with silk uh, floss, mm -hmm. so you can do two things. You can either treat your fingers with it, or you can also take it, get it on your finger, and then run it right down that floss. And it keeps that floss from separating, but it doesn't stain it. Okay. That answers well, that, it. That's a very good tip because I didn't know that about putting it on the floss. I've been trying to avoid putting it on the floss because I didn't want to stain the floss. But isn't also, I've seen some people use like cobbler's mm -hmm. wax mm -hmm. on the on the silk, but, but that does, because cobbler's wax is dark, and I think that does affect the color of the silk, but for some reason, I, I, I thought they were doing that on purpose, that they wanted to actually uh, influence the color of the silk. Well, or, they, they may I have misunderstand wanted, that. They may Greenwell's have wanted to darken it. Green, Greenwell's glory is the fly you're thinking of, uh, where they use cobbler's wax and um, primrose floss and darken it. Uh huh. And they want it darkened, Eric? Yes. yes. Yeah, it gives it a translucence too, or a a, a, um, a waxy a waxy finish. You know, um, I, I know I've, I've done it on some green walls glories. Well, a feature that we added last week and that we're going to continue on into this week is we call it sharing, and it could be anything and everything under the sun. In fact, some of the conversation that we just had could very well have been under sharing. Well, we're going to get a different kind of sharing tonight from the other side of the world, because my buddy Paul in, uh, in Port Macquarie, Australia, well, he wants to share uh, a bit of life down there, shall we say. And Paul, you can do a screen share and show people what the kind of neighbors that you have to live with. Down in the bottom, underneath the big tree, see two kangaroos. Yep. The uh, baby kangaroo had his breakfast on my front lawn today because I got up and got to clean the kangaroo poo up. 
but they're under the uh, under the tree there. We've had, you, at one stage we had about thirty kangaroos <clears throat> in our area near the retention pond, and a couple of the males were getting aggressive, and I don't know what happened, but they all disappeared. And it's good to see two of them coming back. Yeah, this came from Australia. <laughs> That's the Australia possum. <clears throat> oh, that's and, gorgeous. Yeah. And uh, I, I was real lucky. I had a bunch of flies that, in a box. And the guy didn't have enough money to pay for everything. But he said, well, you take 60 bucks for what's in the box plus a possum skin from Australia. And I said, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so this probably cost me maybe ten dollars fifteen dollars it has a price tag of 25 on it but i know they're cost more than that now i think i might give you 60 for it jim gretchen and i got to digging through the the fly tying room the other day because i well the story is we have a an organization in canada that asked us to shoot some videos for them for their website and i was looking for some dubbing tools and I could not find them. And so I managed to find just gobs and gobs of treasures that I had forgotten I had that we haven't seen in 20 years. So bottom line is we're going to start getting rid of stuff. We're going to start tonight. We're going to gift this. And then add, later on, we're going to start offering stuff for sale to people just to get rid of things. But this is my fly tying kit from the 80s and early 90s. And it hasn't been used in all that time. Last time it, I found a brochure in it that said 2004. So that's the last time it was used. It is full of capes and hair and fur and everything un, under the sun except for except for the, the, the tying tools. I'm going to gift, the, gift this to Healing Waters in Omaha. So, John Wright, this is coming your way. I expect you to share the wealth with folks. Al, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. My veterans, thank you very much. And we are, yes, we can use it. It's just, it's amazing. It's, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm speechless. The and only, the only thing speechless. is, is that we're not looking at your face right now. We're looking at one of those Japanese flies. They'll kill bosses or whatever they're called. And um, <laughs> so, those are the Polish <laughs> there, flies. Now there's the guy I wanted to see. Anyhow, <laughs> this is coming your way. Oh, man, that, that is so cool. For all the rest of you out there, um, just to give you an example of some of the stuff that we've got that we're going to be sharing, we're going to add a spotlight with John. I want to show you something. In fact, I'm going to go to the vice. Here we go. Take that out of the vice. This is a tool that Gretchen and I developed uh, <laughs> back in the... 90s. In the 90s. Yeah. And that we sold the rights to it to to Wopsy for an undisclosed amount. Well, you know, it's a great idea. It's a whip finish tool. It's also a dubbing loop tool. So it, it does it does both. And we thought it was a great idea. You couldn't give the damn things away. Well, anyway, <laughs> there is a bunch of blank metal things that were manufactured with no handles on them. And I must have about 200 of them. And we're going to gift these out over the next weeks. So if anybody is interested in receiving one or two of the blanks to put your own handle on, send me an email to the email in the upper right-hand corner. You'll get two more sent to you if you send a person's name that isn't on our list right now that wants to be added to the list. Thanks everybody for joining us for tonight. It's a wrap. We'll see you again next week. Good night. <laughs>